My beloved brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to bring you uh, greetings from your brothers and sisters uh, in the Toronto area, the GTA. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, will bless this community and protect you and guide you in these very difficult times that we are going through. The events that are happening in the world uh, are moving at a rapid pace. And every week, it's like something different is happening. This is affecting Muslims uh, throughout the planet. And um, things are in, in rapid change. But what we have to remember and never forget is that um, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ did not speak from himself. He spoke from above the seven heavens. Inspiration from above seven heavens. And one authentic hadith, he has informed us, يَكُونُ فِي أَخَدَ الزَّمَانِ كَذَّبُونَ دَجَّلُونَ يَأْتُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَحَدِيثِ بِمَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا أَبَعْدُ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ لَا يُدِلُّونَكُمْ وَلَا يُفْتِنُونَكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ said, there will come near the end of time great liars to the point of being like false prophets. And they will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray and beware that they put you into a fitna, a trial, tribulation, a gray area, and Sadaqa Rasulullah it has come to pass. Digital technology. In the past 20 years, the relationship between people has drastically changed. Now human beings have the ability to make what is real appear to be false. And to make what is false look like it's real. And then beam it around the world so that people simultaneously will be misled. Or they could be educated. But for Muslims, what is happening in the past few months, years, it's intensifying now. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for us. And we have to look at this as part of the of Sunnatullah. Of Sunnatullah, it is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In authentic hadith, it's in Abu Dawood. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ummati hadihi, ummatun marhuma. Laysa alayha adabun fil akhirah, adabuha fil dunya. Al fitan was a lazim al qata. The Prophet ﷺ said, This my nation is a nation that has mercy on it. Its punishment is not in the next life, but the punishment is in the dunya. Here. And he named three things fitan, Salazul, Qatar. Three things. Fitna is the plural of fitna. And a fitna is a trial, it's a tribulation, it's a, it's a confusion. Confused situation. A gray area. A real bad temptation on people. And we see it happening now. The confusion coming out. Lies being propagated about Islam. Incidents happening in front of our eyes, you don't know uh, what to believe or what not to believe. Right? So this has come to pass. Second, Zalazo. Zalazo is earthquakes. And they did a test of earthquakes which were 6.0 on the Richter scale or above. And in the past 30 years or so, the majority of these earthquakes have hit Muslim countries. The third is Qatar. That is murder. And you see how the blood of Muslims, right now on the international uh, you know, scale, is cheap. Of things that are happening you know, in the world today. But this is a wake-up call. It's a type of purification that we have to go through. In the same way that when you get a cut on your hand, a wound, it hurts more when it's healing than when you get it. So there's a reason why there's pain in the wound. Because the pain constantly reminds you 
that this is an area that needs to be protected. Pain is a purpose for it. So similarly, pain in our nation, if you look at our history, right, it has, it has come upon us at certain points in order to wake us up, right, to prepare us for something which is big, which is about to come. I spent a few years now in the field now, traveling around with Muslims in about 61 countries, visiting Muslim communities. And I found that there's something really odd that's going on. Number one, if you look at um, our numbers, our numbers are huge. There's Muslims all over the place. You find us, you know, not only in the classical areas of Islam, but you will find Muslims in the distant peripheries, the distant zones, and our masjids packed with people. Many communities you go to, they have to have uh, one or two Jumas. One place I went to, they have three Salatul Jumas. So numbers is not our problem. They're estimating over 26% of the Earth's population now are Muslims. Okay? So numbers is not the problem. Wealth is not the problem. We have some extremely rich people. Some of our people are so rich, you know they have uh, the top 10 rich people in the world and I think recently they put Bill Gates uh, on the top again. He's the richest. Some of our leaders, they don't put their money in the bank account, man. To know how rich Bill Gates is, you gotta go to his bank account, right? Some of our leaders, they don't have a bank account. The gross national product of the country is his bank. So you cannot even understand in numbers how much money they actually have. We also have large standing armies. Thousands of men at arms. We have universities. We have knowledge. We have potential youth. But there's a serious contradiction going on here. And I want to leave this, you know, this thought with you to, to think about. This is what we're trying to understand what is happening. Because historically this contradiction has reached an epic point at certain points in Islamic history. And that is the potential is so great, but at the same time there's a contradiction. With the great wealth, there is also great poverty. There are places where on one side of the border they throw the food away after the wedding party. On the other side, people are almost starving to death. I experienced this myself, you know, having lived in Southern Africa uh, and lived amongst the Muslims there in places like Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Malawi. And I w went to the Timbuktu and the Sahara, and Mali, to see Muslims there strong in their faith but yet having hardly any materials at all. And then I travel to the Emirates. And there you see people with so much money, it's obscene how much money they actually have. It's the same nation. So this is a contradiction, right? You have standing armies, but yet we're not getting the result from this. Okay, so, so it's a, this is a contradiction now. And this is what we're trying to see, what would be a solution to this. I'm putting this out to you, because the younger generation. What I found is in Surat al Hasha, at the end of Surat al Hasha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Ya ayuha al-ladheena amun attaqullah, wal tandu nafsun ma qaddama lighad, wa attaqullah, inna allaha khabirun bima ta'amalun, wa la takunu ka al-ladheena nasu allaha, fa ansahum anfusam. Ula'ika hum al-fasiqun. This verse that Allah says, O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah, and let every soul look to what it put forward for tomorrow and fear Allah. Surely Allah is well aware of all that you do. And be not as those who forgot Allah, so He made them forget themselves. Surely they are the disobedient ones. So the gem of wisdom is in these three letters, Noon, Seen, and Ya. Nasiya. You add one letter to a meaning, you, you add a more of the meaning. Ziyadatul harf, ziyadatul ma'na. So you say, La takunu ka ladina nasullaha fa ansahum anfusam. You forget Allah, He make you forget yourself. 
And so your, your wealth will not come to the, to the poor. It will not go to the poor. Your armies will not liberate Masjid al-Aqsa and the places that need to be opened up. Intellectuals will argue over small points. Ulama who, who, who could be leading the world argue over small trivia, right? Differences between school of thought. Do you move your finger into Shah or no, you don't? Okay, so this is the contradiction, right? The state of Nishiyan. The good news for us is that there's a way out. If we were like the other nations, they would be talking about us like they talk about the ancient Greeks. They would say, you know those Muslims, they're really great. Look at the buildings, but they're gone. The ancient Romans, the ancient Egyptians. But Allah tells us clearly, in Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. So if we change what is in ourself, right, there is potential. Allah Azza wa Jalla has promised us to change the conditions. But the first job we have is inside. People are looking for a political, an Islamic political system, Islamic economic system, Islamic social system. The first begins inside. There's too much, as the ulama say, there's too much pride. People are proud of their color, proud of their height. He's tall, proud of his language. Some people are even proud of his passport, although his cousin's on the other side of the border. But he's proud of his passport. Right? But these things, these material things are here one day and gone the other day. And if blood and family and tribe was enough, then the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab, is Hashimi. He is the prophetic blood and he's burning in hell. So blood is not enough. Right? And we're in fool's paradise to think that, that if you come from a certain country or your family's a certain family, you're saved. Right? It's our actions now. We're being called to account. Right now. So pride. Pride. We have to now do something. First is to think about Allah Azza wa Jal. Think about where we come from. We all come from a humble place and we will return to a humble place. Even if you can be the most beautiful person, woman in the world, the richest man, nobody's going down there with you. So pride is one of the problems. Another is hasad. It's jealousy. These are real issues amongst us. Hasad. And hasad is when you are jealous of somebody, they make some progress. Right? Ali pulls up now with a new... Uh, you know, Porsche, he pulls up in front of the masjid. So what do you think about that? You want one like, like Ali? That's fine. But if you hate to see him in it, that's the hasad. Or they have a new baby. And the other women are jealous of the baby, right? This is hasad. The dangerous thing about hasad is that it hurts the one, the hasad more than the masud. The one who has the hasad is the one that's destroyed even more. Although it can affect the other person too. As the Prophet said, beware of jealousy. Right? Iyakum al hasad, fa inna al hasada yakul hasanati kama takulu nar al hatta. Beware of jealousy, it will eat up your good deeds like a fire eats up fire. It will eat it up. Anger, emotions, adab. Too much anger. We have to learn to control our emotions, to control ourselves, right? So these are some of the issues. It's the internal Muslim. It's the heart. It's the heart. This is what the problem is, man. And, you know, may Allah bless you and protect you here. You know, whenever I come and see a community like this, you know, I just, you know, make dua for you, man. Because when you start to get big, then you're going to see, you're going to be under a test. I was the imam in Toronto in the Jami Mosque in 1985. Right at that time, there was only like two major masjids in the Toronto area. Jami Mosque was probably one of the biggest ones in the whole country, right? Then people poured in, 
right? But at that time was blessing. We were all together. So we learned to um, respect each other. We respect different schools of thought. Right? We respect different Islamic movements. Right? If there are different jamaats that are here, then each jamaat has you know, a focus in it. It has something to offer to the ummah. Right? The problem is now is when each person, each group feels that their jamaat is the way. The only way. But that's not how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ functioned. They were different personalities, different people, but yet they were um, in one line. For instance, they say that Khalid ibn Walid, the sword of Allah, radiallahu anh, they say that he did not memorize a lot of hadith. He did not know a lot of Qur'an. So when it was time for Salat, the people did not, they see Khalid, they look around, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, let that man, let him lead Salat. The thin man, Yemeni man comes and leads Salat. And Khalid ibn Walid, over six feet tall, sword of Allah, prays in back of him. That's his leader, right? So he accepts him because he's focused, right? He had mastered the book of Allah. Right? But when the enemies of Allah came, then everybody said, where's Khalid? Where is Khalid? Put him in the front. You see? So at one point you're in the back, and at another point you're in the front. What did Khalid do? Did he form a jama'at? Hizbu Khalid? Tariqa Khalidiya? Madhab Khalid? Jam'iyat Khalid? No, he was just one of the Muslims. He's just one of the Muslims. See, that's his quality. And, and that is the way we are today. And so, you know, cherish these times when you're together. We call it the, the golden days in Toronto, right? The golden days, when you, because we, and we have to come back together. We're going to have to learn how to live together and accept differences amongst ourselves and, and, and learn how to work out differences. Because sometimes there's more than one way to do something. And they're both correct. You listen to many Jamaats today, they say, no, it's either my way or the highway. It's either black or white. Haqq or batil. But after the battle of the Thunder, the Prophet ﷺ was visited by the angel Jibreel a.s. And the angel told him, we have not taken off our armor yet. Banu Quraida. There was treachery in Banu Quraid. So the Prophet ﷺ said, anybody who believes in Allah on the last day will not pray Asa except in Banu Quraid. And it happened head south of Medina, like right? they going south. In the area of Medina. And as they're going south, everybody's moving, the word went out, so we head south. Different people have to go different places because you got to go home and put on your armor or whatever you have to do, meet down there, everybody's moving. Some people are on the road, and us is going out. Now what are you going to do? Think about this. Some of them, some of them said no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna salata kana ala mu'minina kitab al -mawfuta. Salat is written on us. I'm making my asa prayer. The other one said, said no, the Prophet ordered us to pray in Banu Quraidah. So I'm, I'm going to wait, and I'll make it even if it's after Maghrib. Okay? And when they got there, they started arguing. If it was us, there'd be two or three masjids there. Two or three jamaats. Right? And they went back to the Prophet And if you know the answer, don't you know, answer it. Many of you do. If you don't know, you, you can try. How many of you, just offhand, if you were in this situation, how many of you would pray your asa on the road? You all know the situation, right? The Prophet said, pray in Benu Khuraydah, asa. You're on the road there, and it's going out. But he commanded you, right? Man yuti'a rasoolah faqad ata' Allah. That's what Allah said, you obey the messenger, you obey Allah. How many of you would pray on the road? How many of you would pray in Benu Quraidah? 
Some of you are not making us. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, how many of you pray on the road? When they went to the Prophet Sallam, he said, You're both right. Both of you? Correct. Because they made their own limited ijtihad. Right? Not a scholarly one. But the limited one, you have to make a decision. And it was based on, you know, good sources. Your niya was clean. Right? You have a good source for it. And you made your and, and, and you made a decision. The other ones, Nia, the attention was clean, had a good source, and you know he, he was correct. So although they did different things, both of them were correct. Think about that, man. And think about some of the problems we have, right? Sometimes people have differences, you know, amongst them, and both sides have good intentions and sources, right? And they're different. But does that mean that we have animosity? No. Right? We have to learn to accept differences and learn how to work out differences amongst ourselves. This is a really important point. Right? And, and, and to see ourselves as a people of the Qibla. Right? We follow the great Imams, you know, because they have laid down uh, you know, a system for us. Okay? But you cannot be blind followers. You need balance now, right? You've got to accept other schools of thought. I went to a country once and the Imam read Salat al Maghrib. Um, and then I, I said, Waladah, lean. I was the only one in the mosque. I said it out loud. After they said Salam alaikum, they said, Where's that shaitan? And they came to get me. Right? So then they came to get me, right? The I'm the shaitan that said Hamin out loud. Right? I said, get Bukhari hadith. And they looked at it and it said the Sahaba said it so loud it shook the building. They said we didn't know that. Like we didn't know that. Because of a narrow uh, approach, right? So that broad approach is important. Also respecting other movements within Islam. Other people who focus on certain issues, that's good. And other groups focus on other issues, that's good. At the end of the day, we should be in the same stuff. We have to be together. It's really important now because there's moves being made intentionally to divide us. And if we are divided, if we are divided nation, we fall. It has happened in our history before. If tribalism and nationalism comes in, pride of yourself, pride of your family, we fall. Right? When that leaves, then the jama'ah comes. Right? Then we will realize the potential that we have. We have amazing potential. To solve a lot of the problems of the world, we could be solving. But there are people who want to get us caught up in these small little issues. The small little things happen and they're popping up. Muslim did this, Muslim did that. Every other thing they want to make, get something else. Right? Whereas in other nations, similar things are happening. But the whole group doesn't get blamed, right? It's a London situation, right? If a person is standing there with blood in his hands, right? You all know what's happening in London, right? Yeah. If he's standing there with blood in his hand and a meat cleaver, and then he's saying, oh, excuse me, uh, the, lady, the lady shouldn't have seen it. Excuse me? You just chop somebody up, man. You know what mental state you have to be in to do that? It's either that person has, has, has a serious mental problem, or somebody pumped drugs in him. Because that, that's, not a logical, um, that's not a logical movement. That's illogical movement. Like blood pouring all over your hands. Something has happened to that person. Right? They call it, when they come back from the wars here, they call it what? Post-traumatic syndrome. He had a trauma, man. Something serious happened. And if that was a, a, a white British man, you know, who did the Andre Brevik, right? The one in Norway. Who gunned down the people like animals. And he even said he's part. He even told the right wingers, he's part of the right wing movement. They said, no, he's crazy. He said, no, I'm not crazy. 
but still you don't see his name in the press. He's vanished. And the atrocities that he did, and you never see their bodies, right? They don't show you their bodies. Could you imagine how horrendous that atrocity was? What he did to them? And how they're still suffering now. Psychological problems, physical problems. You don't hear a word about that. Okay? So this is not by coincidence. It's by chance. And it, it is taking us away from our real mission. Right? Which is to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To stand for righteousness, prohibit evil, and spread the word of Allah azza wa jal. And, and we can never forget you know, what our mission is. We have a very serious mission. And here in these lands, we have big opportunities right, to be able to spread the word of Allah in these lands. Right, so this is a very crucial time, and you know, I've come here to you, you know, about a project we'll be talking more about in, uh, in none of it. Right, that now, alhamdulillah, there are people embracing Islam, you know, far in the northern region. We went up to Iqaluit, in none of it. This is by Greenland, right? The people, the Inuits, are there. And alhamdulillah, some of the Inuit, one of the Inuit men um, embraced Islam. And he intends to, he, he's trying to translate the Qur'an into his language, in Aqtutak, which was spoken over 10,000 years ago. This is a serious breakthrough for us. These are the original inhabitants of this land. Okay, and, and you know, one sister embraced Islam, not because of marriage, out of her conviction, Hidayah. Not because she wanted to get married. And she put on hijab. And she walked in the streets, and the Inuit people there, they're watching TV also. And they see all the propaganda against Muslims, right? So they saw her in hijab, and they said, Oh, you people are up here also? <laughs> and she answered them in pure enaktotak. And they were in shock. They're in shock. But what that means is, is a challenge to us. That somebody's got to explain to them right, what Islam really is. Who's been up there to explain it to them? Right? Where do they get a chance? Do they have a chance to hear this? You know, we have an alcohol-free society, right? A drug-free society. Right? These are the kind of lessons that we can give to the world today if we're not caught up, you know, in you know, this these diversions. These things are diversions, man. It's fitting. It's fitting. That's what we're in now. Right? We're under a test to see who's serious about their deen and how we're going to act in the test. Right? Because something big is about to happen. It's looming. And if we can be the ones who make the change, then inshallah, uh, maybe Allah can you know, enable us to be part of you know, this major change which is coming about in the world. So I wanted to just give you these few words and the salams from your brothers and sisters uh, there uh, in Toronto. أقول قل هذا واستقبل الله وليكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Just to remind everyone, please let your other